Kali, mera kali, spera kali, nikta. No matter where in this wild, wacky, and sometimes wonderful world you might be. Thank you for making the Highbury Squad part of your day a little earlier than scheduled. There's a big match we're going to get you out for. But before we do that, really looking forward to this conversation with a very special guest. Let's rock and roll. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Evening, everyone. Welcome to the Highbury Squad. Many of you will be listening on replay and those um, listening on our audio platforms. Thanks so much for joining too. Big, massive match tonight. We'll get you out before that happens. Uh, I have a very special guest. Been looking forward to this conversation. Squaddies, by the way, I lose my manners when Super Kev isn't here. At ease, everyone. At ease. And James Green, freelance broadcaster. Welcome to Squad Central. Your first time. First time debut. I wish it had come at a better week. But it does, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes my timing actually sucks, James. So, you know, <laughs> you know, it's um, I think that's the biggest disappointment for Arsenal fans. Exactly what you said. If only we could have just taken them right to the very end. Um, but it wasn't meant to be. And you got to spend some time with our gaffer. Uh, but before we do that, OK, as always, when he's not here, he is here. So we're going to take this in a couple parts. I'm going to play a video for you from Super Kev and the squaddies. And uh, we'll go from there. He has a couple of questions for you that will lead to our conversation and to your insights. Let's rock and roll. Hi, Sophie, James, squaddies, at ease. So, um, sorry I can't be there with you. But I've got, I, have a, I have two questions. Okay. One is... If you could sum up Arsenal's season, I know there's still two games to go, but if you can sum up Arsenal's season in a sentence, what would it be? That's question one. And question two, how many players do you think we need in the summer? So that's my two questions for you. Look after yourselves, enjoy, and uh, no doubt I'll be watching it on replay. But look after yourselves, everyone. Take good care. And you know, squaddies, James, Sophie, at ease, squaddies. He's, He's, he? Isn't he the best? The best. He's just the best. All right, James, take it away. In, an, in a sentence. In a sentence, to try and wrap it up in a sentence, uh, for me, it is, it's been a season of progress, a season of hope, a season where an opportunity might have slipped away, but a season that Arsenal fans can be proud of and a season we can build to the future. I like that. And I think that's a sensible take that a lot of Arsenal fans who see kind of where we started with Mikel Arteta... And I was one that, you know, after 18 months or so thought, mm, is this going to work out or not? Highly critical of him. But you can't deny the journey of progress. Process has gone to progress. And we've seen that this season. Um, real quick, because I think this is going to weave in a little bit into your conversation that you had with Mikel. But the number of players, Kev's question on that front. Yeah, good. it's interesting, actually. There's so, there's so much going on surrounding Arsenal at the moment, transfer-wise, mm. looking into next season. A lot of interesting conversations about players who are going to potentially be leaving the club. Uh, you know, some big news coming out this week, Granite Xhaka. The stories around Kieran Tierney are not going away either. Uh, look, I think there's going to be big changes. I, I really believe that. I, I think it's part of the continued process that Edu Arteta are working towards. He's still not satisfied completely with the squad at the moment and he, he wants improvements made to do so we're going to have to sell some players but I think there's players that hold quite a lot of value inside that Arsenal squad that actually it wouldn't be too bad an opportunity to move them on at this point uh, mm -hmm. for Grant Decker we, I'm sure we'll get onto it maybe later um, it's, it's a shame to see him potentially leaving the club because actually he's had his best season 
at the club uh, this year. He's found his place, found his position that for me works best for him. Uh, but as regards players, look, I think we need a couple of a uh, couple of central midfield players. Definitely, I think we need fullback cover, either a versatile fullback who can play both right and left side. Uh, and I still want to see another attacking player come in. Ideally, preferably a number nine who can mm-hmm. score some goals in a different way than maybe we've got in the squad so at the moment. So look, you know, three or four players, I'd be pretty happy with that. I think there's some good there's some good rumblings. And I'm hearing some very good things. You know, the Declan Rice rumours are not going anywhere. I, I do know that Mikel Arteta has had a conversation with Declan. I know that Declan Rice is really impressed by everything that Mikel Arteta's been saying to him, which is positive. Because if we take it back to a year before, there's no way Arsenal were ever a consideration for Declan Rice. The turnaround this year just shows where Arsenal are on the map, that we're able to you know, potentially attract a player of the calibre of Declan Rice, who for me is, I mean, he, he fits straight into what we're doing at Arsenal and what mm-hmm. Mikel Arteta is doing. Champions League football, we can offer him, offer him straight away. So, look, the money's right and they can get that over the line. That'd be fantastic. So, to answer Kevin, Kevin's question, three or four for me would be pretty good. I love this. And uh, let's stick with it for a minute because feel free to just get into your, you know, you, you were talking about how you know that Mikel spoken to, to Declan. And do you think the fee could scare Arsenal off similarly to Madrid, i.e. if West Ham push too far, whether the player has said, I want to play for you or not, we all know it's all going to come down to money, just like in January, right? And some people think that was embarrassing for Arsenal. But now when you, you know, hindsight 2020, we made the right deal at that time. Mudrick can go on to be a superstar and probably will. You know, he's a great player. What's your take on that? The Caicedo, the Declan Rice. What 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 came from that conversation that you had? Yeah, I mean, look, I asked, I actually asked Mikel about it in the press conference. And as this was before I sat down with him. And I actually, I said, you know, would the club be willing to break their transfer record if the right player came in? Now, all these press conferences, you've got to be so careful how you work. With Mikel, he gives absolutely nothing away. He is really closed off. Uh, Mm -hmm. He also revealed in a press conference that he doesn't enjoy being in front of the media, doesn't enjoy the sound of his own voice at all, which was quite, quite interesting. and makes a lot of sense, actually, when you see him in interviews. Sometimes he cuts questions really short doesn't give particularly long answers doesn't go into too much depth or detail uh, but I asked him and, it, and it, he pushed past it but look where football is now and football is changing and the fees of 100 million are going to become more and more apparent so do I think Arsenal can stretch that far I do I do believe they they can I believe that the owners will see the progress the club's made this season I think they're going to allow as much many funds available as they possibly can, obviously keeping within financial regulations. As I mentioned previously, Arsenal got quite a lot of assets that they could potentially move on and actually bring in quite a few uh, uh, higher calibre transfer fees as well. And this is, and I think this is a big thing for uh, for me about what a great job Mikel Arteta has done. Now, criticism for Arsenal over the last you could say decade, 15 years, is that the players they're bringing into the club, how many of those players have actually gone on and improved? And Mm. not many in that time. Whereas if you look over this last year, there's not many in the first team that haven't improved. Uh, There's not many in the squad that I don't believe haven't improved. And that obviously, as well as improving the performances on the pitch, it improves their transfer value if we want to move them on. So that puts the club in a much better and a much stronger position as something they've been craving for a long, long time. Mm. So look, I believe that it's the right time to do it. You've got Champions League football coming in, so you've got more money coming in in that regards this season. If you rest on your laurels and, and accept kind of where we're at this season and think, yeah, the squad's good enough to compete next season, that's when we'll slip behind. Because we know, you know, Chelsea, Liverpool... Uh, Spurs won't be, um, Newcastle might be there. <laughs> uh, you know, City are going to be strong, Man United are going to be strong. So, you know, you've at least got five clubs who are going to be strong, if not stronger next season. So you've got to push on again. And I think there will be backing 
and I, and I expect to see a lot of movement in the transfer window this summer. Yeah, and I, I don't buy, you know, that narrative that's kind of brewed about Arsenal will drop off now. It'll be another 10 years for the until they challenge. I mean, they said last season that we wouldn't, you know, be anywhere near Champions League position and, and here we are. You know, there's there's talk of Declan Rice and Caicedo, obviously the two sexy names that are out there right now. Yeah. Caicedo, by the way, what a player. Uh, he's, I mean, we saw at the Emirates just a few days ago what we would be buying. And some Arsenal fans are actually even more excited about him, James, than they are about Declan Rice. Understandable. He, he, he's, a, he's a top player. Tw- what, 21? 21 years old? This, this player has got an incredible future. Mm-hmm. Energy, engine on him, smart. Pay- he's got pace. He's strong. He reads the game really well. He's... <laughs> This is the dilemma now because obviously we couldn't get that deal done in January, which was a big shame. Uh, I think a lot of Arsenal fans, I think, would, would have been disappointed at the time. Mm-hmm. January is just a horrible month to get a player in. And I know Brighton, I I was down there quite a lot in January and I know they were never letting him go in January. It didn't matter for them. The transfer fee didn't matter in January. Mm-hmm. It was, no, you're staying because we've got an important season. You're an important part of it. You will stay until at least the summer. And then we'll work on something from there. So it's disappointing. Do do I expect or do I see Arsenal getting both? It's so unlikely that we're going to get both. If we did, I mean, it's a huge step up. And that will be a really big push on to next season competing in the Champions League. I actually think if Arsenal pull off a Rice and a Caicedo, and I want to get to you about Cancelo as well here in just a second, but that is probably the most exciting transfer window ever in terms of recent memory. But I say ever because Ozil was very, let's not sugarcoat it. When Meza Ozil signed for us, that was so exciting. It was thrilling. You're talking about a World Cup winner who was a superstar, right? Alexis Sanchez was very exciting. You know, those uh, marquee kind of signings, we only made one, one and one, right, James? But here you could have two players, arguably could go anywhere in the world and play for any team, any team. And if we pull that off, that would be incredible. Any insight into his thinking on, and we'll move away from the, the the new player scenario here in just a second, James. Kieran Tierney, you mentioned earlier, he's getting a shot now because Zinchenko is injured, but also Tomiyasu. I think if Tomiyasu was fit, I don't think Kieran Tierney gets um, a start. Maybe, I don't know. And then the right-back position too. There's been talk of Fresneda, who's a younger player, is going to be more affordable, if you like, but versatile, just like Cancelo, can play left, can play right. Um, Both can bomb it down the flanks, something that I don't think we have on that right side, especially the bombing. Benjamin's been amazing, but the bombing down the right flank, those kinds of Manchester City type, you know, players, I think is what we're looking for. But, Cancelo, a bit of trouble at City, didn't really seem to have another rumble at Bayern Munich, a harmonious dressing room, which I'm sure you talked about. Can you see him going for a player that might be troublesome, even though some people thought Trossard might be trouble when he came from Brighton because he kicked up a stink about leaving? Yeah, look, play, players have different relationships with the clubs they're in, and it, just because they may be struggling in one club doesn't mean they're going to carry that on to another. You know, everybody deals with different issues surrounding uh, what's going on within their own clubs. Uh, look, you, you you mentioned a few players. Uh, Fresnader, yeah, good, exciting young player. That might be more of an option because of the price of it. But um, can I see, look, Arteta will be working closely on the players they bring in. We, we actually did talk about it in the one-on-one a little bit, that, mm-hmm. you know, how, how much, you know, the players you're looking to bring into the club, how much are you looking at their mentality on how much they can improve and want to improve and their willingness to learn. Now, if you bring those players in, you can imagine that's that's the perfect mould for Mikel Tess. It's a perfect scenario for the where the squad is at because it's, it's a young squad, it's a young group that want to learn, want to improve and want to experience success together. As Jao Cancelo, look, Mikel Tess will know him better than a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, he's worked with him at Manchester City. He'll, he'll, he'll know all about him, all about his personality. It doesn't excite me. I'm not going to lie. I, do I think he fits 
our profile and what, how Mikel wants his left back in particular to play, the versatility to play on the right side, which let's be honest, Benjamin White is a is a is a centre back by trade. Yes. He's been pushed into this right back role. He's done exceptionally well, but ultimately, if we did have right back cover when Saliba got injured, Ben White would probably slot into that right centre back role. Um, but with Cancelo, I'm just it, it's it's going to cost a lot of money. And I think people need to understand that. You know, I, I think at the moment, Bayern have got, from memory, Bayern, Bayern have got an option of about 50 million. I think it's about 50 million to buy him off Manchester City if they choose to after this mm. low spell at the end of the season. Now, it sounds like they're not going to uh, trigger that clause. So then it's, OK, what do Manchester City do? Do Manchester City and will Manchester City want to sell another one of their players to ask them mm-hmm. their closest rival this season. They might look at it very differently now. And they might yeah. go, hold on a minute. They've got something serious going on. Okay, we're not going to help them anymore. So look, I, I just the Cancelo one, I can understand the links. And the links, and, and obviously we all know, links come from, we, we can create a link. <laughs> a link can come from anywhere. Of we could do one right now if we wanted to. <laughs> I, I, could, I could create a link. I, I really could. Uh, very easily. And there's a couple of things I might know that, might stir the pot, but it doesn't. There's no guarantees in anything. But with with Cancelo, it, it's it's the fit. It's a, the previous relationship with City with Arteta. Mm-hmm. It's the fact he might be available, and people are going, okay, yeah, that Arsenal must be interested in him. But I'm not. I'm not convinced yet. I'm not convinced. But that's not me shutting it down because you never. You never. Yeah. Know. Yeah. No. No. I and and there's look. There's going to be certain plays that are going to be attached, right? I mean, Gundogan, I always pronounce his name wrong, and Gundogan, <laughs> whichever way, Gunny, <laughs> who's amazing, legend. Let me just call him Mr. Legend. <laughs> call him Mr. Legend, do well. I mean, again, I feel that we need that kind of player to come in. You know, Jorginho's experience in the dressing room, maybe on the pitch he's not going to be able to play consistently, consistently, consistently. Is he the answer long term for us next season? I don't think so. And if he if he was if he left, I wouldn't I wouldn't care. Maybe that's harsh. However, in the Champions League, coming on with 20, 25 minutes to go, a Jorginho becomes a really attractive option, um, doesn't he? But any chance Mr. Legend does leave City and comes no. our way? Very much a chance. Contract is up, so we don't really know where he's going at the moment. Uh, is he? Will he look abroad? I think he's going to have a lot of suitors. I think Manchester City might have a dilemma now because of his performances in recent weeks. And this season in particular, actually, he really stepped up. If you look back to last season, I think Bernardo was more preferred in that central midfield role than Goodwin was. And mm. now we're you know, talking about him. Uh, look... I don't disagree with you. He is 32, though, it has to be said. But if we are talking about maybe the post-Granite Jacket era, there needs to be a replacement for that specific position. Well, good one fits the bill pretty well uh, in that role, more advanced central midfield role. But again, you know, is, is it possible? Yes, I think it's possible. I don't okay. think it's off the table, but I think a lot of that will come down to what the player wants now. That's yeah. solely on the player. Where does the player see... Maybe the next few years. Does he want to try it? Like go to another league? Does he want to move back to Germany, or what does he want to do? Um, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. I wouldn't yeah. necessarily get my hopes up too much on him. Okay, I won't. I love him as a player, and you know there has been like one of our listeners said a desire maybe in the past he's expressed Barcelona. Who hasn't? Name me a player who hasn't expressed interest in playing for Barcelona. Right. Yeah. Let's get stuck into this a little bit. This was your sit down with the gaffer. He looks um, like he's going to kill me there, doesn't he? <laughs> he looks like he's going to kill everyone all the time, and I'm here for it, I have to say. <laughs> After years of apathy and uh, ease uh, and players doing exactly what they wanted, I am all for ruthlessness. Mm-hmm. Um, just tell us how it was and, in particular, what struck you, James. Um, this is a great pick, by the way. Yeah, the lot. and Mikel Arteta. I mean, that, that's a real him. He was really happy to chat to me. Um, <laughs> now, look, I've I've interviewed him at press conferences quite a few times now over the last couple of years. And what you see him at a, at a press conference, he's tricky. He, as I mentioned earlier, he keeps his cards really close to his chest. Sometimes he's in a mood where he clearly just has very little interest in speaking to the media. Uh, I remember a post-match 
Oh, who was it? I can't think of who we played. I'm sure we won. We certainly won the game. Um, I can't think of who the team was against, but he had literally been asked three questions in the press conference and he got up ready to leave and he had to be told to sit down because that wasn't enough questions asked. Uh, and he sat back down. He doesn't enjoy that part of the job. He really doesn't. Um, but look, when I when I got to speak to him one-on-one, -on -one, it's slightly different. You know, we move away from the press conference situation where you're surrounded by other journalists it's just literally you and him sat there on the box and before we even start it was nice to have a conversation with him where I did share which team I support which is Arsenal for everybody listening and uh I, actually the first thing I did was actually thank him I thanked him and I thanked oh, him oh I love that because for me uh if I'm sharing I'm always a sharer uh so work is great but my personal life at times this year has been really tough. I've had some tough things going on. And my escape was watching Arsenal. And watching Arsenal this season and actually having that, that joy, that hope, that love for the football club come back again. To see the fan base reunited this season like it's been. Going to the Emirates, experiencing the atmosphere there this season, which has been just amazing. And that's meant a lot to me this year. And it's really, really helped me. And... Um, and I thanked him. I said, thank you. And I said, I'm, I'm not the only family who thinks so. that. I'm sure there are many because you have brought this love to Arsenal back again for all of us. And that's really important. So I think that warmed him up. So I teed mm. him up perfectly. That's and beautiful, that's by the way, because I know you've, you've had a significant, um, horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, And by the way, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And that is such a – for a broadcaster to do that as well because – I want people to understand it's really fine line sometimes, you guys, when you're, you're a broadcaster, you're a journalist, but you're also associated with a club and a club that you've loved for a long time. And I love that he embraced that too and that you were able to, for you and your own cathartic process and journey to be able to say that. That was very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. No, absolutely. And, and it, it, it was important and because that's how I felt and, and that's how I feel towards the club. Um, but look, my job... As a reporter, you know, I, I, I'm asking the questions. It doesn't matter whether it's Arsenal. It doesn't matter whether it's Tottenham. And I'll go in and ask Tottenham. I won't have a bias. I'll ask the same questions that I need to ask. And that's just how it is. But with Mikel, it loosened him up straight away because of the difficult press conference that we'd had previously. And I was thinking, OK, right, we've got to try and get something new out of him. And actually, you know what? It was, I found him fascinating. I found that he is a guy that doesn't take defeat, doesn't take disappointment lightly. It affects him immensely. We talked and covered a lot about what happened uh, last year, 12 months previously, with the Newcastle trip to St James's mm -hmm. Park. And we were back there last week. And we went back to that place and we went back to the feelings that he had, that the squad had. And, and he said, you know what, like football and sport, it's so special because it gives you the opportunity to right the wrongs. And they were mm. so disappointed with how they played that that almost led them into this season. And I think that was something key that I got from that, that these players didn't want to experience that again this year. And that has been a key motivation throughout the year. Now, look, we're back on it again. Are they going to learn from what's happened at the end of this year? I hope they will. I hope they learn from the last seven games and I hope they look at it and go, OK, I don't want to feel like that again. So we're going to improve again. And it, it felt like he is always looking at improving. A couple of couple of key things that he said to me, one was, which I found very interesting, one was he doesn't feel any player in that squad has reached their peak yet, which wow. I thought was fascinating. So he doesn't believe they've reached their peak. Uh, it doesn't matter who they are. And I, and I asked him afterwards, I said, you mean nobody? He went, nobody. Nobody's reached their peak yet. We have still got a long way to go. He is still looking at improving. The likes of Martin Erdegaard, who's been terrific. But Kai Saka drifted off a bit towards the end of the season, but he's been terrific. I mean, you know, Gabriel Jesus, Martinelli. These are players that are young and have a bright future. Gabriel's been immense this year. Uh, another player I know you're putting up on the screen. Uh, look, these are players that he can work with and he can improve. He he feels like there's many more steps that this team have got to go forward, but they've also got to learn from the disappointments. Um, and then another standout I asked him, actually, because, you know, if we look at the Premier League as a whole this season, 
more managerial changes than we've ever seen before. It mm -hmm. feels like in football there's less patience than there's ever been before. And I asked him about it. I said, well, are you like a shining light on what, what happens when a club's patient towards you? And he responded and he, and he said something really interesting. And he said, well, actually, it's all well and good being patient, but if you're not moving forward or you're not showing any signs of improving, what's the patience there for? And for him, mm. the importance of winning that FA Cup in 2020 gave him that time. And I think he did. He, it, it probably did because yes, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, you were I know you were quite critical of him at the time. I I, I can stand here safely and I'm not smug about it. <laughs> I will very much team Arteta. I could see what he was doing. I could see where we, what he was trying to do, and I could see where he was trying to take us. I had a very different view at the time. I was a bit more patient. I was willing to accept what the tough times we were having because mm -hmm. I could see where he was trying to go to. But I've learned from that, by the way, James, like the I was in the instant gratification mm -hmm. group when it came to like the the zero, the start of the season where we lost and we were at the bottom of the, the table. That's where I kind of reached the end of my rope. Um, so, yeah, but uh, carry on. <laughs> then, but then the next month, you got manager of the month and turned things around straight away. So, look, um yeah, so he look, he's he's a, he's just a fascinating guy and he is doing a lot of work at that club. He's but James, not... do you think do you think when you you the comment that you made about the time, do you think he realizes in essence that he's lucky his club is Arsenal and he's had that luxury of time? Um, because the FA Cup did buy a lot of love coupons, didn't it? Would it have been oh, would it have been different? Much. Very much so. Bought, bought him a lot, but what an incredible achievement that was, by the way, winning that FA Cup that year. I mean, it was absolutely outstanding. And I don't think he gets actually enough plaudits for coming into a club that, what, bottom half of the table from memory when he took over from Unai and then winning the FA Cup in that season, the disjointed disjointment of COVID in that time as well. Mm -hmm. I think he deserved a lot of plaudits for that. I mean... You know, there's not much going on in the other half of North London, trophy-wise, is there? So, and in that time, they were a lot more settled than the Arsenal were. So, uh, look, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily say he's lucky, but he is so ingrained in that football club. That football club means so much to him. You know, spending the end of his playing career at a club like that under a manager like Arsene Wenger, he, he's ingrained in that club and... Do, do I think he feels lucky? I don't think he ever would give that a second thought, Sophie, if I'm honest with you. Right. I don't think he feels lucky. He just knows he's in a job and he's going to do the best he possibly can. And as critical as Arsenal fans will be when Arsenal lose or decisions aren't right, he is a manager who will feel every ounce of that and he takes the weight on his shoulders and you can see it in him. You can mm -hmm. see how he was suffering from the last seven games he was suffering or the last six games up until the Brighton game that he was really suffering that they had kind of let this opportunity slip a little bit but he was still like holding on to this tiny bit of excitement that actually we can still do it and that that as a football manager and as a fan looking at a football manager that's how I want my manager to be like you know, you said something interesting there and we had a conversation with Rebecca Lowe um, just two or three months ago when she spent time with Mikel in the UK when NBC were there covering games. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, it seems like he's evolved even from when she was telling us about him in the press conference. You know, she said that she felt like a lot more people would root for him if he just relaxed a little bit. You know how media support, not support, but if I think you can explain this maybe better than I, but... You know, when a manager is a certain way with the media, the media just warm up to him in a different way. And she felt that maybe Mikel's journey is not there yet in terms of how his relationship with the media is evolving. But from what you're saying, it seems to have evolved. But what Rebecca did say was that he seems completely and utterly obsessed with Arsenal Football Club. And she joked, she's like, I feel like his list of priorities are Arsenal, 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 the wife. <laughs> 100%. He, he is. He's obsessed. I mean, we, we got an insight and a glimpse in the Amazon documentary and you could see that. You could see that obsession. But I can't, I, I, I would love to, we will speak again at some point. I'm certain I will speak with him again. Mm -hmm. And I really, and next time when I speak to him, I, I've got so many questions. Obviously, it's a bit different when you're working for a broadcaster. You're kind of yeah. 
you have to you you pigeonhole to a certain extent of what questions you need to ask and what you need to get out of him. But I would love to sp speak to him about how he is away from work because he doesn't. Yeah, he's not the kind of guy that goes home and switches off. He's the yeah. kind of guy that goes home. He's constantly thinking about it. Exactly. He's going thinking about it. Waking up in the morning thinking about it. But it's interesting what you said about what he's like in Prescott. Like Thomas Frank is a prime example. He's like the nicest football manager going. He is so warming to everybody. He gives very open answers. He gives. He's very friendly. He's approachable, and the media love him. And there's yeah. a, I love him because he's so nice to me. And I love that. And I love that I can ask him anything and he will give me some sort of answer. Whereas Mikel is still at that point where he'll shut things down. If he's Do you think he learned that from Pep? Uh, I, I guess Pep. so. You, you would hazard a guess. But, you know, you know, Pep, Pep does that sometimes. I, I've interviewed Pep where he's shut things down and then all mm. of a sudden out of nowhere, he comes out with an absolute classic. Um, Mikel's not quite there yet. He's a little bit more guarded. Uh, I think that's just down to what he said at the end of the press conference where he said that he doesn't enjoy being in front of the camera. Yeah, he's had a couple of fun nuggets this season. The dream where he mm -hmm. said, I dream. That that was like, you could see him kind of warming up to some of those things. I wanted to ask you, does he have, I'm looking forward to seeing him um, in the US. They're coming to DC and Los Angeles. So I'm looking forward to just him being in a room and what vibe I feel from him in the room. When you, you've interviewed, you've spoken to Peppers, you've said, you know, you've seen Jurgen Klopp, you've seen, you've seen a lot of these Premier League managers. When we're talking about the elite managers, when you approach, you're sitting down when you're with Mikel, does he give off this, oof, this guy's got an aura, a vibe about him? Yeah, he does. He, he, does. Uh, he puts everyone like, you kind of shuffle in your seat and you mm. feel like, right, I'm going to sit, sit up straight. And it's exactly the same feeling when Jurgen Klopp's in front of me or Pep Guardiola. You do. And you also, you're making sure you are absolutely prepared 100% because you feel like he is the kind of manager, if you say anything slightly wrong, he'll clamp down on you or he'll just ignore that question because it's not worth it. It's very similar to what Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola would do. So, yeah, he does. He has got something about him. And I think there's also still this intrigue and interest in him, we I still don't think any of the media know who the real Mikel Arteta is. Mm -hmm. I think I kind of like that. I, I like it too. And I, I don't I, I like that he keeps a lot to himself. But I think very slowly we are slowly peeling. It's like an onion. He is. Yeah. And we're slowly trying to take these layers off and get him to understand the real Mikel Arteta. But I tell you what, Arsenal fans should just be delighted. In my opinion, should be delighted with the manager we have. You, you could be upset, you could be disappointed with how the season's end, but I, I really I really hope that all Arsenal fans, when the season ends, in a, during a long summer, you can look back and go, you know what, we're in a pretty damn good place to come second in the Premier League to what I believe is right now the best team we've ever seen in Premier League history in Manchester City, who, by the way, have had to win 11 straight Premier League games to overtake Arsenal, which is just incredible. And it would have required Arsenal to be pretty much perfect going into the end of the season. I think that says a lot about Mikel Arteta and the job he's done. And it says a lot about these players that they're making steps. OK, this step was probably a little bit too far, but my God, next season we could have some fun again. James, real quick before I let you go, um, do you have a couple more minutes? We yeah, have a couple no. more minutes for us. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm um, because the words. I don't worry, you got another twenty-five okay, minutes. Okay, cool. Before. This is too good because yeah, um, <laughs> I wanted I wanted to see, and we've got just a few questions for you from our listeners as well. But I want to hear what your response is to listeners or Arsenal fans. Um, you know, he might not be an Arsenal fan, by the way. But I'm just saying, yeah. delighted bottling an eight-point lead. There was an eight-point lead, but as Byron says, it was never eight points. City had games in hand. Right. Um, I really, I don't like the word hate or despise, but in this case, the bottle choke narrative, I've def I've defended that to the point where I, I don't even want to talk about it anymore because I just feel that Should City be. even took a while to, to, to win the Premier League when their new owners came in. Um, what What's your answer on, on that front? Oh, I mean, if it, it, I ignore any talk of bottle choking, it's absolutely not. It's absolute nonsense. It's a bit of this modern day 
football fan. I had Sona Radio off the other day um, because <laughs> you know, I think you know who I'm going to probably say popped up on the radio and claimed to be an Arsenal fan and he shouting bottle 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 this is um and he contradicts himself it's quite amusing because he spoke about the you know the narrative that this is a young squad um but he went put southampton a young squad and like they they got relegated yes yes exactly <laughs> they got relegated yet yeah, we nearly won the squad, league <laughs> a, a second in the league right it, exactly look there's no I'm not having this bot- bottling narrative at all. Uh, from my perspective, there's a brilliant video. I don't know if it, I don't know if you've seen it, Sophie, or any of the viewers. And it's uh, NBA star Janis. Oh Ant- yeah, we shared that. Yeah, right. the Milwaukee Bucks superstar, MVP, mm. uh, former MVP, NBA champion. He was asked a question because they finished top of their conference this year, lost in the first round of the playoffs, and he was asked, "Was it a failure?" And he got really annoyed, and he explained why it's no such thing as failure in sport. You can only have one person winning. So in the Premier League, there's only going to be one winner. Have Arsenal failed? No, we haven't failed. Uh, will we learn from the experience? Yes. Uh, you know, could could we have picked up those points that we spoke about? Uh, like, you know, West Ham, Southampton, Liverpool. Of course we could. We, we know that. But is it is it failure? I don't think so. When we came two seasons ago, we were eighth. Then we were fifth. And now we've come second and pushed Manchester City to the last few games of the season. And as I will continue to mention that they are, in my opinion, the best Premier League side we've ever seen. I, I'm not having it. You can't mm-hmm. talk about football players like that. I don't think either, looking at the demeanour of the players on the pitch, I don't, I don't, I've never seen, I haven't seen that bottle. I haven't seen them like give in. I, I think Sunday was, I think Sunday just, for me, everything hit them at the wrong time. The City result against Everton just just basically burst their balloon. I think that was their hope. You know, City had travelled to Madrid. Difficult game. Got a difficult game against an Everton side. Um, and that might have been it. And I think they were just a bit, that was it, shocked. And Brighton were exceptional. But there's no way they've bottled it. They, they've learned a lot. They've learned a lot. They've improved a lot. They've got... They've, they've made stri- so many giant strides from last season. We only have to look at the uh, St. James's Park comparison. You know, mm-hmm. that was a really awful performance 12 months ago where they looked so shy, nervous. Yeah. And Tottenham. Tottenham away. Tottenham away. Crystal they, Palace. They, Crystal they, Palace. they righted some wrongs. It, uh, not Brighton, Manchester City and Southampton, Brighton. unfortunately. I, 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 no, they didn't. Yeah, of course, but... <laughs> This is a Premier League. Like this is this, but we've also got to all understand what it takes to potentially win a Premier League title. Mm-hmm. We can ask Liverpool. Liverpool. There you I, go. Yeah. You know, I know someone said about Liverpool bottling it. They were they were ahead. Okay, maybe that was more of a case. But I don't. I still don't like. No, no. I mean, I think our for our listeners are saying when Liverpool finished second to City on the times they did in the one pointers as well and the millimeter ball across the line. Who was saying they bottled it or choked it? It was like, what a season, what a fight. Um, but look at but again, look how close they got and they still yes, didn't do it. And, yes. Because and Manchester City are setting the standards and setting the bar so high at the moment, mm-hmm. it makes it that much harder. We should, in my opinion, as fans, we should be so proud of what we've seen. We move on, we learn, and we hope we we see this team learning and improving next season. And I believe. They will do. I believe they'll learn from this experience. I think they'll come back stronger. I think the squad will be improved. And I think they'll be in an even better place next year to hopefully close that gap even more. And I do believe as well that the owners are going to put the money where the mouth is and build on this. And we've seen them do it. And I keep bringing them up as an example in terms of you know, when I compare them to the American sports teams, a lot of fans are like, shut up, Soph. That's American sports. No, it's called business ownership. And they have proven to be winners when they invest and they focus on building championship team team winning sides. LA Rams, the Avalanche, the Denver Nuggets. Well, don't mention Bri- the Denver Nuggets. I'm Sorry, a, I know I'm you're a, a Laker fan. I'm a, Laker. I'm a hardcore <laughs> Laker. Uh, but yeah. I tell, whoa, what a fight back in the second. I tell you. That was a warning shot to the Nuggets because that was an incredible fight back in the second court. And, 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 and I'm sorry, anybody who's not interested in basketball. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was the it was the best defeat you could probably have in basketball. I think where you lose the game, you go, 
yeah, it's all yeah. right. Yeah. You see, I said that to um, uh, Javier Hernandez, Chicharito, in the derby against LAFC. They played so well. And I said to him, is there anything like a glorious loss, you know? And he was actually happy that I asked the question because as an athlete, he's like, I will take a loss like that if my team and we've played our hearts out and uh, no one likes to lose. Mikel Arteta certainly isn't accepting second, is he? This is what I want to make clear here, um, James, as well. Even though we're saying it was a good season and we were proud of the team, the manager himself is not accepting this. 100%. He is not accepting it. Now, now I, I might be a bit soft. I don't know. But he's not accepting it. And that's what I love so much about him. He's not accepting what he's seen this season. He will look at this season that it's a disappointment. He did even told me, he said, look, expectations change during the season. And when expectations change, you have to then deliver on the new expectations that arise. So we saw what happened this year. We, we were, obviously, his expectations, what he was hoping for was Champions League qualification. Simple as that. That was the aim. That was the target this year find themselves at the top of the table for such a long period, the expectation changed. And he wanted his squad to step up mm -hmm. and, and deliver this title. He wanted it more than ever. And he will be devastated more than any other Arsenal fan about how this season's ended up. And he'll be working night and day to make sure that that doesn't happen again. He is a born winner. He doesn't like to lose, as you said. You see him after the games when he loses. He's miserable. He's angry. He's upset. You can tell the demeanour from players, the conversations that are happening in the changing room after games. They know what's coming from Mikel if they lose and if he, they don't meet the standards that he accepts of them. And he will tell them. So, look, you know, we, we can be proud of them. We can look at this season as a step forward. And, and he, he will look at that as a step forward, but he will also look at it as big disappointment from where they were to not be able to cross that line. Brilliant. Is it, listen, uh, we've got tons of questions, but here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have James come back uh, at the end of the season, if you're willing, James, and we can answer some of the questions. There's a lot of transfer stuff, which I don't like getting stuck into particularly. However, I love the type of questions our listeners ask. Um, and I would love to get into a little bit more of maybe your starting 11 next season, what you would like to see. Um, and then maybe we could get um, our Q and A at the end of that. And um, does that sound does that sound good to you? Absolutely fine. I, I've seen the comments; they've been quite nice. So uh, <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> we'll, we'll take it for now. It's not we have we've nice. had a couple of City fans come in, and uh, but we like that. Listen, we have Liverpool fans that called our phone in the other day, trying to help us, comfort us in in our um, you know our our loss to Brighton and stuff like that because they know they've been there. But I want to give you the closing statement. If there's one thing I haven't asked that you experienced with Mikel Arteta, something that our fans, because what I love about um, talking to you is, yes, there are fans in England and some internationally that get to see the Sky Sports stuff, but our global gunners, the, some of the people that um, a lot of our listeners on our show don't get to see it, um, and they might on YouTube, but this is a totally different experience of what you what you saw, and I want you to tell us if there's something we I may have missed that you want people to know. Oh, that's a, I, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think, look, I, I don't think there's anything missed. He's he's just a manager that's so focused on his job. Um, we know that in, within football, players, managers, doing media is part of their duties, and that's what comes with it. Now, they have to accept that. That is part and parcel of it. Mikel is a manager that if he had the opportunity to, he doesn't want to pass a message. You know, you have some managers who like to put a message across via the media. He's never like that. If he hmm. didn't do another interview again, he'd be delighted. He is, all he wants is just to solely focus on the job in hand and the job he's got. But what I would say is just speaking to him about how they're looking in the future. You know, that yes, he had his full concentration on this season and trying to win a trophy. There is a lot going on behind the scenes, a lot. And he is absolutely involved in every aspect of what is happening at that football club. He has got his hands all over it. We're talking about player contracts, which we will get announcements soon. There's going to be 
an influx of announcements of, of players signing new contracts. I know that they've put another contract on Reese J, uh, Reese, um, J, Reese Nelson. Uh, t- t- I think today, yesterday, the new contracts, I think it's like a third one they've offered him now. So we wait and see. But look, we'll hear good news on Saka, Saliba, Ramsdale, Erdogan. I think I'm almost certain they'll tie Erdogan up to an even longer contract. I mean, he's got... He's got two years and an option for a third. So, look, he is focused on that aspect. He's focused on the transfers. He knows what type of players he wants. He's got such a terrific relationship with Edu, which is great. You know, when you see... And look, if I take myself away from the broadcasting side and go back into football fan mode, when I see some of the other clubs and the relationships with sporting directors and managers and even responsibilities for signings just solely on the sporting directors, I kind of look and just... I just laugh mm. and smile because that's not happening at our club. You need that synergy because I felt like for a long period we stopped having that within the club and we've got it back and and that's really important. So look, yeah, look, Arsenal fans should just be aware that Arteta it, it, it isn't false. This isn't a narrative they're pushing out. He is over absolutely every aspect of what's going on at that club. He's giving his blood, sweat and shit tears and I'm not I might be sounding like I'm like part of the Arteta fan club or anything like that, but that is just the fact. That is the truth of what's happening on the ground. And um, and yeah, and, and look, look, Sophie, I, I'm like the luckiest person in the world. You know, I am doing a job that I dreamed of doing when I was a, a young lad growing up, watching football, writing at about five, six years old, reports on my little notepad, watching the football. It was always a dream to do what I do. And it is a privilege every single time I do, whether it's, speaking to Mikel Arteta or if it's speaking to a player. Uh, I, I'm incredibly, incredibly lucky. So would I like to come back on your show? Absolutely. If I can answer questions to viewers, mm-hmm. fire away. Anything you've got, bring it on. Oh, I as love it. As as I can take it. It's okay. I know Kevin's going to love this episode. He's going to love listening to it because, um, you know, he, he does the sideline stuff and – but the, 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 I want every, I always want my listeners to understand, you know, a journalist's job, a broadcaster's job is so not easy. And, and we get a lot of flack and sometimes it's deserved and most of the time it's actually not. And I just want to say I appreciate so much that you came on and you gave us your insights and we spoke. But also the way you carved and cultivated your conversation with Mikel as a fellow broadcaster, I just wanted to say, like, well done. It was such a a great, engaging, compelling piece as an Arsenal fan um, because you come from a place of care and so your questions come across. You're not looking for a soundbite. You're not looking for a headline. You're truly looking to get inside the mind of who some think is a genius and others think you know he's surplus to requirements because he did not win the league which I find crazy and I was a person that didn't rate him as our manager you know in the zero 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 season so thank you um James thank you very much it's a pleasure thank you for having me on and squaddies thank you um and thanks to the Manchester City or Tottenham fans who've uh, you know it's a great show when the uh, when your when your rivals come in and want to have a have a go, so uh, we love that. And James is all ready for the banter, no matter what. Um, some really great comments, a great show, great insights. Definitely need James on again, uh, and some really cute, some really um, adorable uh, messages uh, for Vinny and Vesper. By the way, thanks uh, to the, the the person that sent me the DMs on uh, on our on our email. More messages here for. For you, very enjoyable and insightful today. Uh, Sophie, can you please ask him my question about Mikel? I will next time. This is Mohammed, our listener from Palestine. So in our chat box, we have people from Palestine, Canada, the US, Nigeria, Australia, India. Thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in um, and we appreciate it. We will be back tomorrow night with Kyle Campbell, myself and Kyle for the Total Football Show. Um, So please tune in for that. In the meantime, please share this episode with all your Arsenal friends. Don't forget to go over to Zenith Coins and get your uh, 15% discount. Okay. And uh, until then, we will see you. James, thank you again. And until then, everyone at ease. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad.